Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is a recap of trial days 20 and 21 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a double drink, and let's recap. Trial day 20 started back with Ashley Vallier, the physical match forensic scientist, retaking the stand. She continued explaining the individual pieces of plastic that the Commonwealth alleges came from the defendant's car. We saw from the evidence bags that Proctor was continuing to find those pieces of taillight at 34 Fairview up until February 18th. Remember, the incident was overnight, January 28th and 29th. The witness's identification shows that she didn't analyze these pieces until 2023. So a full year later, we saw pictures of all the red taillight pieces that she was able to match up to each other and all the clear taillight pieces she was able to match up to each other. On cross-examination, the defense counsel walked her through the large range of dates that the taillight pieces were collected. She testified that Trooper, Trooper Proctor collected the evidence from 34 Fairview over a period of basically three weeks following the incident. Next, they brought out uh, a picture of the mostly completed jigsaw puzzle of a taillight that she pieced back together. He asked about a noticeable hole evident in the completed tailpiece. She didn't receive any taillight pieces that fit into that particular spot. Now, let me remind you of the women's testimony, and I'm talking about Carrie Roberts and Jen McCabe, that they saw a small crack or hole in Karen Reed's taillight overnight when they went back to John O'Keefe's house to see if he was somewhere in the home. Harry Roberts said it was a small hole with a piece of wire sticking out. I think she specifically said it looked like somebody could, you know, easily catch themselves on that piece of wire. When the Commonwealth is showing us the damage to Karen Reed's car, it's not just a small crack or a hole. It's almost the entirety of the taillight that's obliterated. Let's interject really quick that we were shown ring camera footage for the first time of the defendant backing her car out of John's garage and reversing it up until the point that she backed into his parked car in the driveway. That video was taken in the early morning hours of the 29th, that first time she left the house to go look for him when she woke up and realized that he wasn't home, right? This is the video that I was asking to see weeks ago. So I think the insinuation was that this hole being shown to us in evidence post jigsaw puzzle with the missing portion, that hole was caused by Karen Reed's car hitting John's car in the driveway. And the reason it's missing from the Commonwealth's evidence is because it wasn't available for Proctor to plant with the rest of the evidence. The next point the defense made with this witness was regarding the glass, not the plastic, the glass pieces found on the bumper. Remember those magical glass pieces that traveled miles and miles in, you know, blizzard storm conditions and were still just laying atop of the bumper? Those glass pieces and compare those to the glass found near John's body. Now, the conclusion that I heard was that the glass that was laying on top of the bumper did not match the glass that was found near John's body. We'll get more into that with the next witness, who was Christina Handley, another crime lab forensic scientist who performed physical matches for those pieces of glass. Her testimony was presented in an extremely convoluted way. And this is on the Commonwealth because she is a Commonwealth witness. I personally had to go back and watch this multiple times. And I'm still kind of unclear on what glass matched and what glass didn't match. Now, there is a way of presenting evidence to make it understandable to a jury, make it palatable. We are a jury. We're a social media jury. 
the real jury in the courtroom doesn't have the benefit of rewinding and slow-mo or 1.5 speed. They don't have the benefit of going back to listen to testimony again, to try and make sense of it. Anyway, rant over. All that to say, I think the point of her testimony was that no glass from the drinking cup that was found by John was found on the car bumper. There were five pieces of glass found on the bumper. Those bumper pieces of glass were the same type of glass as the one piece of glass found by Proctor on the street. That one piece of glass from Proctor did not match the glass from the cup. And it also did not match multiple pieces of glass recovered by Trooper Buchanick. So the only thing that matched the bumper glass was the one single piece of glass that Proctor recovered. Now, the way that the Commonwealth presented this to the jury was as clear as mud. The defense tried as best as they could to try and simplify the evidence down and also refer to the evidence by the location uh, where it was found. Um, the witness didn't really agree to testify to it that way. And she should have been better prepared to refer to the different pieces of material by their location or by who recovered it once she identified that it was what it was she analyzed. Instead, she only referred to it by, you know, piece 3-2 or patch piece 7-14, which made it incredibly difficult to follow. And I'm not sure if I got it and I had to rewind multiple times the jury. I don't know. It probably went over their head and I wouldn't blame them at all if that was the case. The next witness was Yuri Buchanan. And I'm going to combine the testimony that he gave from day 20 and all day on day 21 together. So Yuri Buchanik was is a supervisor trooper with the Massachusetts State Police. He has an impressive resume. He was a Marine. He did security for presidential helicopters, a military police officer, lots of security clearances. He was Michael Proctor's supervisor, not the other way around. Yuri Buchanek was Michael Proctor's supervisor. So the uh, morning of the incident, the witness was told that the individual subject to the call uh, was found in the cold, in the snow. And it just so happened that Proctor Michael Proctor was the trooper on call from the morning of the 28th to the morning of the 29th. Specifically, he was on call from 7 a.m. on the Friday morning to 7 a.m. on the Saturday morning. So it just so happened that being the on-call trooper, he was assigned to this case. According to a report between the Good Samaritan Hospital where uh, John was taken and the medical examiner per a call at 10.41 a.m., the witness's initial understanding of what happened was that John had been hit in the face with a drinking glass, a physical altercation. Despite this, neither the witness nor Proctor, they worked together, neither of them brought any witnesses to the police station for interviews, they didn't search or process or secure the residence at 34 Fairview. Um, in fact, they didn't even visit the house for several days. Uh, they didn't mark it as a crime scene or secure the outside of the yard. Yes, he did interview the McCabe's and Brian Albert, but that was done in the comfort of the McCabe's home. Now, this witness, we saw a lot of um, evidence introduced through him. So I'm just going to go through some of the main topics of the evidence that was brought in through his testimony. 
bar videos. We saw a video from McCarthy's bar that shows the defendant, John, and friends drinking that Friday night. There were at least seven or eight separate times where Karen Reed accepted a drink or a shot glass from the bartender. She told the witness that she was drinking vodka sodas that night, but we just don't know the exact amount of them. There may have been times when she was being passed water or another clear drink or shots that she added to her existing drink. I think it's clear that yes, she definitely was drinking multiple drinks of vodka soda and or something else. But we know that everybody at the waterfall, the bar that she and John went to after leaving McCarthy's, everyone there said that she didn't appear intoxicated. She didn't appear impaired at all when she arrived there. So either Karen Reed has incredible tolerance for alcohol and could hold her liquor, or perhaps the vodka sodas were being interchanged with plain soda and or tonic and or, you know, some other clear drink. When her blood was drawn the following morning at 9 a.m., we heard this testimony, uh, you know, over a week ago, it came back at about 0.8. They also did a retrograde extrapolation, which estimates what her blood alcohol content would have been several hours prior. They said several hours prior at about 1 a.m., which is after the time that she would have dropped uh, John O'Keefe off at 34 Ferio. At that hour, they estimated her blood alcohol content to be in a range of 1.1 to 1.2 blood alcohol content. So it's still not very clear. Um, the charge for a DUI or operating under the influence, I'm not exactly sure what Massachusetts calls it um, because there were, you know, we saw issues with the retrograde extrapolation that, like almost everything else in this case, is just not a slam dunk for either side, in my opinion. The Sally Port video. The witness, Trooper Buchanick, said he went to the Canton Police Department to collect a portion of surveillance video of the Sally Port. Now, we were shown a very weird backwards video on direct showing the Canton Police Department Sally Port when Karen Reed's vehicle first entered it after it was seized and uh, and towed back from her parents' house in Dayton or Dayton. All the writing in the video shown was backwards, suggesting that the video was mirrored. It was cut in and out of time. So for example, you'd see somebody walking, then the next millisecond, the person would vanish, sudden, suggesting either glitches in the video or time jumps or time travel. I don't know. It was weird. <laughs> the video was played by the Commonwealth with no context when they entered it on direct examination. So I'm not sure why they entered it. Either way, the witness said that neither he nor Proctor ever touched the right rear taillight of the vehicle. So in cross-examination, the witness clarified after being asked, of course, that the video was indeed mirrored. So everybody who was wondering if the video was, you know, backwards or mirrored, yes, he said that it was mirrored. But defense counsel pointed out some tomfoolery in the video itself. Lots of people congregating around the damaged right rear tail light, and one individual in particular who, with nobody around, spends a long time in the area of the right rear tail light. Now we can't see exactly what's being done because of the angle of the camera, but it's odd that this one person who the witness says he isn't sure who the person is, whether it's Proctor or somebody else from uh, Canton PD. It's weird because the person, you know, just kind of sees, you see the top of the head of the person in the area. 
And the person moves away once somebody else comes into his view. So there was one moment where he was by himself back there by the right, right rear tail light. And all of a sudden, another guy comes into his view and suddenly he leaves the area. So it looked a little suspicious. It did look suspect to me. Like what exactly is going on? The witness testified that he and Proctor collected John's clothing from the hospital. They picked up his outer and undershirt from the hospital floor. He described them as being soaking wet. And um, I think he said they had vomit on them as well. He said he double bagged them and put them in the back of his vehicle for safekeeping. They left the hospital and went directly to Karen Reed's parents' house in Dighton. And then they went to the Canton Police Department. At some point, I think when they were back to his office, Massachusetts State Police, he said someone, he doesn't remember who, retrieved the clothes out of his vehicle, took them out of the bags, and laid them out on butcher paper so that they could air dry. Once they dried, he's not sure who rebagged the items or who processed them, but either way, it was not him. One of the evidence bags noted that it was processed six days after being set out to dry. Now, the witness had no explanation for what could have happened to the items in that time. He also admitted that there is no log in the Massachusetts State Police that shows who accessed evidence at any particular time. The first report showing any recovery of evidence in February 2022 was first made on November 4th, 2023, over a year and a half later. So all of the evidence, all of those shards of glass, the clothing, the hat, which we didn't even get into yet, the sneaker, all of those things that were being found and bagged in February of 2022, they were not put into any evidence log until November 4th, 2023. So that leads me to wonder if some amount of evidence was never checked into the evidence room at the Massachusetts State Police until it went to the crime lab. So where was it? Where is that chain of custody for the evidence? It's a good question. That's also clear as mud. Here's another thing, the ring video from John's house, subpoena responses. We learned that Proctor submitted uh, warrants to be executed uh, to the Ring company for Ring camera footage from John O'Keefe's home. We saw some of the footage already uh, in earlier trial days, but we know that some of it was missing. For example, when Karen returned to John's house after dropping him at 34 Fairview, she would have been by herself. Where is that footage? We don't have that. Another example, when Karen pointed out the damaged taillight on her vehicle to Jen McCabe and Carrie Roberts, which they both testified to, and we saw the video of them arriving at John O'Keefe's house and there was no pointing out of anything. Um, Carrie Roberts said, well, it must have been on their way out that she pointed it out to them. But we don't have video of them leaving. Another example, the witness testified that when he asked for the missing video, Ring Company couldn't provide it. The witness said that Proctor was behind the ring videos. He filled out the warrant. He received the evidence. He communicated with the company about the receivables and the data that was being sent back pursuant to the warrant. Activity logs were requested from the company, but the witness said that they didn't receive any. At that point, defense counsel showed the witness a document and asked the witness if he had ever seen the document. The witness said, no, he'd never seen it. Apparently, 
Ring Company had provided some activity logs, and the witness admitted that it was the first time learning about the existence of activity logs for the Ring camera um, in this case. So there's some lack of communication between himself and his subordinate, Proctor, who was in charge of all of the ring data. There were secondary searches done at 34 Fairview. We know that because there were multiple pieces of evidence that were found over a three-week period, right? So the witness and Proctor decided to go to 34 Fairview on the morning of February 3rd to conduct the secondary search to look for missing evidence. They were looking for John's baseball cap and they asked the Massachusetts State Police Crime Scene Services to assist with the search, not CERT. They located the baseball cap. Shocker, right? This is the first time that we're hearing about there being the baseball cap, you know, being put into evidence. They also located a drinking straw, not a mixing straw, but like a full sip sip <laughs> drinking straw and uh, multiple pieces of plastic, presumably tail light. And he said that those things were located on the grass, um, ground level near the flagpole of the yard. He said because of that, he told his troopers to make a habit to stop by the property every day for the next several days um, on their way to work and on their way back home to see if any evidence was revealed due to, you know, melting snow. He went back himself the next day because he was told that Canton cops, specifically Chief Berkowitz, who we know is a friend of the Alberts and a friend of Higgins, the chief had found evidence and wanted to turn it over to him. The witness knew that Canton PD at that point had been conflicted out of the investigation, but he said that he didn't find it unusual that the chief of police was looking for evidence at the subject property that he was conflicted out of. I, that's just not believable at all. What do you mean you don't think it's weird that the chief of police is, is looking for evidence on, on a case that his uh, police department is not even on? On February 10th, they recovered six pieces of red and black plastic and 14 pieces of plastic and glass. January 29th, February 11th, February 8th were also additional dates where more evidence was found. He never requested for the crime scene unit or for CERT to come out to the property to document on GPS where evidence was being found because so much had been found, he said. There was no documentation of the exact location, which seems sloppy to me because how would the accident reconstructionists do their job? How do we know the relation of evidence to other evidence? How do we know how far away this evidence was from the location where John's body was found? It just reeks of sloppy investigation. Now, they played an audio recording to in court. This audio recording was made on June 9th, 2022. And the witness said that it was when the witness was speaking with Karen Reed and a portion of that interview or conversation was recorded. Now, the Commonwealth only played about 10 seconds of that audio recording. I don't know if the audio recording was only 10 seconds, but only that 10 seconds was, was played in court. During those 10 seconds, Karen said, or a female voice said something, because I actually have never heard her voice. I've never heard her voice. I've never heard her speak before. The only time that I've heard her was in some of the recordings during trial where you just hear her screaming in the background, but I've, I've never actually heard her voice. I know she's done interviews and stuff like that, but I haven't watched any of those. So I don't know if it's her, but it 
purports to be her on this audio recording. So during the 10 seconds, she said something about being in on the same joke and her taillight being cracked and John being pulverized. I, he wasn't asked any further about the contents of that audio recording. So we have no context what that was about. But 10 seconds seems an awfully short amount of time to um, to speak with, you know, this potential defendant. And I have, I, did she know that she was being recorded? Where was this recording taken? I So many questions. Yet more questions. It seems like every day of trial, more questions are just piled onto the growing hill, the growing mountain of questions that everybody already has. Another set of questions came in just a small line of questioning during which we learned that on January 16th, 2024, so this year, this year, the witness and Trooper Proctor met with a sergeant from the Needham Police Department, which I believe is a police department in the state of Massachusetts, to provide buccal swabs, so the inner cheek swabs, for their DNA. And that's all we heard about that today. So that was also left up in the air. I don't know. We'll maybe hear about it. Hopefully the defense uh, we'll ask him about it. I I think there was a um, a sidebar right after this. And when they came back, they just went on to the next uh, topic. So I have no idea what that's about. Um, I'm lost. Remember, guys, I'm not following this case anywhere else. I never followed this case before we started. I know that there was a lot of hoopla around the goings on of this case and that there are very divided camps of people. I'm not, I'm not one of them. I'm just watching this trial like an actual juror. I haven't made up my mind. I'm seeing the evidence that's being provided and presented in court. And my ultimate decision of whether I think Karen Reed is guilty of the charges or not will be determined based on the evidence that's presented. So I don't know what's happening outside of court or I, the rumor and the gossip and the innuendo. That's a shout out to you, Kathy. I don't know. I don't know any of it. So I'm lost. There probably will be people who know what, you know, what the DNA swab was for, or they'll know more about the audio recording uh, of Karen's voice saying those things, but I have no idea what any of that meant. So at the end of half day trial 21, we got a day of all trooper Buchanan. He testified about the ring videos from John O'Keefe's house. There was this question whether there were missing videos that we should have seen, like the video of Karen coming home or the video of her showing the ladies the damage to her car. So the question is, did somebody delete the footage? Um, if somebody deleted the footage, would that be shown in the access logs? Where are the access logs? Because apparently Ring Company sent these access logs in response to the search warrant. Trooper Bukadek said they never received access logs, or rather, he's never received access logs. The question is, well, did Proctor? And where are they? Speaking of Proctor, is Proctor going to testify in this case? It doesn't seem like the Commonwealth is going to call him. The defense today brought out the search warrant return which is the document from law enforcement to the court saying, this is what we received pursuant to the search warrant that the court issued. And 
the search warrant return said that Rain Company sent account data and video data and access logs. Trooper B said he'd never seen that stuff before. He certainly had not seen the access logs. Um, and he said probably because he wasn't in charge of the search warrant. The search warrant was all Proctor, not him. Uh, so after the whole ring video line of questioning, um, we got a very long discussion about the Sally Port video from the Canton police station. On the direct examination, Trooper B testified that the video was a true and accurate representation of the Sally Port on cross. He was asked about that and he admitted that mm, actually the video is actually mirrored. So what I said on direct, mm, I take it back. It's not true. It's not accurate. It's mirrored. Other things that were pointed out on cross-examination, um, like there were no reports documenting the extensive evidence retrieval process from uh, all the dates in February that things were found outside 34 Fairview until November, 2023, like a year and a half, almost two years later. We don't have a frame of reference for any of that evidence because nobody measured the distance of any of those pieces of evidence from a fixed object like the flagpole or the fire hydrant. And they didn't bother asking for uh, GPS um, pins to be put in so that anybody knows or can reconstruct where any of this stuff was found. The only GPS pins that we have are the very, from the very first search conducted by CERT, when they put in three pins and they decided not to put in any additional pins because they just would have looked like they were on top of each other. Finally, at the end of this day, we heard that the Commonwealth filed a motion about something this morning. Well, that motion will be heard first thing on Monday morning. There is no court tomorrow. That would be Friday, June 7th. Next week, apparently, the trial schedule will be full days of trial, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with no court on Tuesday. I will probably have to do a mega uh, recap after next week because I will be traveling and out of the country and I'm unsure about my levels of internet access. But don't fear, I will still be here. I will be back. Another important thing, we had the judge to the jury that they will begin deliberating this case the last week of June. Yeah, so that's about three weeks from now. We'll see if that happens. So thanks for joining me. Um, I will see you guys again. Don't forget to hit that like button on your way out and make sure you are subscribed to the channel. All right, until the next drop, see you later, friends. Peace.